where we will focus a little bit on actually the catalysis work and uh, making the catalysis uh, a catalyst and also um, some of the uh, uh, work that's either done at UK or Center for Applied Energy Research focusing on biofuels. So it's my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, uh, Sam Morton. He is with the Center for Applied uh, Energy Research and he will give us an overview of the current biofuels research at the University of Kentucky. And um, Sam is working with, um, with Mark Crocker in, uh, on uh, algae research and I think that's part of the, the overview. So please help me welcome uh, Sam Morton. myself with this uh, the technology here. All right, well, uh, um, thank you for uh, allowing us to come and talk a little bit about what we're doing at the University of Kentucky. This is specific to the uh, Center for Applied Energy Research. I, I won't be really talking about the extensive work going on in chemical engineering or at the Ag Campus or any, any of the main campus activities, except where we have collaborative relationships with them. Um, I, I am, as she said, Samuel Morton. I, I'm, I work a lot with Mark Crocker, who is uh, unfortunately vacationing at home head. <laughs> since his regrets and, and the weather and for having the, and for imposing me on you. Um, biofuels in Kentucky, the, the question really comes up, why, why Kentucky? And, and there's a couple of real good reasons. First off, we already have a really well-developed agricultural sector. We've got significant biomass potential. Um, and we already possess a, a fairly robust uh, biofuels industry, both in biodiesel and uh, ethanol. Uh, secondly, uh, Kentucky has a significant quantity of primary carbon dioxide emitters, especially because more than 93% of our power is produced from uh, coal-fired power plants. So we have a, 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 a lot of opportunity in the area of carbon dioxide mitigation and that conversion into biofuels and algae. Just to give you kind of an idea of this, the, the existing potential, there's about three and a half million tons of agricultural residue and waste in Kentucky right now. Um, that's sufficient to produce only through the cellulosic ethanol route about 308 million uh, gallons of ethanol annually. Uh, that number does not take into account um, crops that could be grown specifically for biofuel production on land that is either underutilized or <coughs> reappropriated or, or redirected for biofuel production. And, and for example, this campus or switchgrass or any of the uh, woody biomass products. Uh, there are a number of challenges to biomass utilization. Many of us are familiar with this. Number one is recalcitrance. Uh, evolution has done a spectacular job making plants difficult to decompose. So here we are coming in kind of late in the game and saying, well, we can do it. Um, and so we have to figure out routes and strategies that can get around this innate recalcitrance um, that may involve using strategies other than uh, biological. Biomass has low energy density, and consequently the argument on high transportation costs, there's a a pretty rational explanation that it's going to be very difficult to move the biomass from where it's produced to where you actually need to use it so that you can get economies of scale in your production facilities. Um, lastly, the elemental composition of most biomass is very far from ideal. Uh, just in terms of energy density, at the bottom of the chart here we can see anthracite, coal, and petroleum. Um, most of the biomass is, is, is half or significantly less uh, as energy dense either by mass or by volume compared to our more traditional uh, fossil fuel energy resources. So the question then becomes, are we going to use biological strategies or thermochemical strategies? Uh, at the Center for Applied Energy Research, we focus on thermochemical strategies because they allow us the potential of being able to take the factory to the field rather than the field to the factory. So we focus on strategies for utilizing biomass that uh, are, we use heterogeneous catalysis, um, very small scale apparatus that can move as the biomass is produced, because again, biomass is seasonal in nature, that will allow us to move around the biomass production unit, convert it into a, a rational and reliable, if, if that's just a feedstock, and then that can then decrease the overall transportation cost to a larger centralized refinery. And lastly, we are focusing more recently on the utilization of platinum, um, because it's very difficult to convert via biological processes. And it has, if you've ever looked at the structure of the lignin, it's full of these wonderful chemical structures that we use in our, our chemical uh, 
platform chemical feedstock chain now, that if we could release those from the, the lignin matrix, that we would have significant uh, environmental and economic benefits. To this end, one of our strategies has been looking at a solvent-based um, biomass uh, liquefaction system in an extruder reactor. This was a small scoping study where we evaluated the suitability of a uh, Killian uh, extruder reactor to produce uh, bio oil from uh, lead biomass. Uh, we use an initial stream of decant oil, which if anyone has decant oil laying around, it would be really great to know that we've had a lot of problems finding a reliable source of decant oil for this study. We use decant oil for startup, and thereafter, um, after a period of time, we would use a self-generated oil slipstream uh, to replace the decant oil. Uh, the reactions occur under fairly mild conditions and in fairly short residence times. And as we renovated this unit and got to the point where we actually got some data, we actually have really good results. Um, most of our, our materials are produced in the heavy gas oil. How would we utilize this bio oil? A lot of strategies could be um, some of our more traditional routes where we either coke firing or gasification with the fissure tropes and the transportation fuels, um, or the possibility of doing um, fuels and, and chemicals um, from the biomass and bio oil that's produced. But once you've got the crude bio oil produced, you've already decreased that transportation penalty of moving the woody and very less <coughs> biomass from the field to where it could be converted into any of these large facilities in a refinery of uh, scaling benefits. Another set of our work is focused on the upgrading of triglycerides, specifically to jet fuels, although a lot of interest is put on the production of biodiesel. However, we're focusing on the C8 to C17 hydrocarbon alkanes, which are very uh, exciting and desirable for uh, jet fuel production. We use a decarboxylation strategy, which allows us two benefits. We don't require hydrogen, to the degree that's required for hydrogenation, and we do not produce a glycerol waste stream, which is a significant hurdle to the biodiesel uh, industry at the time. Just a, a quick overview of one of our model compounds of triesterine deoxygenation. We see most of our, our products are in the C15, C17 range, which is very good for um, jet fuel uh, additives. They, they are in the boiling point range, not desirable for uh, jet fuel. And there appear to be some um, some fatty acids, whether they're contaminants in the in the fresh air we used, or or their production of the reaction, which will not quite certain. Um, lastly, we got pretty decent yields on our fresh air. Now we use these small compounds to allow us to not utilize a, a less robustly analyzed a soybean oil or even algae oil in some of our more recent work. We have a uh, open access biofuels laboratory that we're in the process of setting up. Some of you may see the announcement when the Center for Applied Energy Research has awarded one of the NIST expansion grants as part of the uh, uh, AARA program, which will be built in the next year. Uh, we will actually have a significant amount of lab space in that facility um, to house our analytical tools, which are being uh, acquired uh, over a number of years. We have a series of GCs and GCMS, mostly <coughs> equipped with uh, simulated distillation systems. We uh, have a one gas refinery gas analyzer where we're getting ready to acquire okay. nothing to be used in line with a uh, continuous uh, high pressure reactor. Uh, we have uh, a pyrolysis system that we're going to be acquiring along with um, an HPLC with uh, <coughs> several detectors and a um, potentially down the road a, a series of IR systems. We have a number of reactor equipment, so if someone has an interesting strategy of biomass or catalyst they'd like to try, we actually have some reaction equipment that we can, we can open up and provide uh, access to. Uh, more information on this particular project is available on the CAER website, and I can give you my card if, you, if you're interested in it. A more recent project we have started, uh, this is in collaboration with the Department of Soil Science, uh, Plant and Soil Sciences, Chemistry, and um, our group at the Center for Applied Energy Research is looking into the, the construction of lignin for the production of liquid fuels and feedstock chemicals. Um, our, our initial work is focused on the inducing of the plant to produce more lignin, which is a different strategy than a lot of the genetically modified uh, plant projects. They're looking more at making more cellulose and less lignin. We're looking at having actually more lignin in our plant, which would allow us to have more of these background feedstock chemical possibilities. We're doing... Um, in plant modification via herbicide or other strategy, we're uh, 
actually having really good results on this right now. Um, that's a set the bolt in the plant sciences. We're going to try a controlled thermolysis in catalytic conversion and appropriate solids. One of the problems with the lignin conversion is these reactions are favorable at very high temperature, and that makes it very difficult to do solid in assisted um, chemical conversion, especially since the lignin of cellulose and biomass itself is very difficult to solve. Are we doing catalytic cleavage using peroxide and some of the benzylic conditions? A lot of the work is focusing on the beta 5 bond location, not the beta number. And lastly, we'll be upgrading the resulting product streams um, via hydro deoxygenation uh, using in situ generated hydrogen rather than supplying it from an outside or secondary source. Lastly, and, and probably more, I guess, dramatically than the work I've shown you before, is our, our efforts in the uh, CO2 capture and mitigation uh, of coal fired power plant emissions. Uh, so, what we've been doing so far in our joint project with um, Biosystems bio bio and Ag Engineering is the development of a, of a operational pilot scale facility to characterize algae, to screen uh, types of uh, process systems, the dewatering, the growth of the environment, the uh, reuse and recycle of the nutrient material and the biomass. Kind of is a total package deal, but we're, and we're focused not on the open pond strategy, which is the generally favored mechanism in the, both the business cycle and some of the, most of the prior ones. Uh, we're focused more on closed-loop photobioreactors to evaluate how cheap can we make a closed-loop photobioreactor and it's still functioning the way we would like it to function. Because one of the consequences of the open pond is they require very, very nice, very flat land in large respects. And that land usually could be utilized for agricultural purposes. So we're looking at photobioreactors that could be built on land less suitable for either construction or for um, uh, biofuels production. The general overall process is we pull fluid gas in from the coal power plant through our cultivation system. And this kind of gives you an overall view of the project. Read, so I, I won't step through it too much. We're in the process of refining our cultivation scheme. We use primarily flocculation at this time. If you look back through the last 75 years of algae research, the dewatering is usually the great hurdle that stops those projects. And we still aren't much better than letting it settle out when it wants to by gravity. So, We've gone through a series of developmental reactors in order to actually produce uh, the scale. I'll show you in just a second. We have very small reactors that we can increase our culture up from if we're growing a monoculture or a single organism. We're currently not in the process of doing monocultures. We actually allow our required reactor to wild seed. So whatever organism wants to grow in our reactor, we allow it to grow. And then we try to make sure that we feed whichever one will grow the best. That gets around some of the issues with um, external contamination, which the Aquatic Species Program the Department of Energy identified as a significant hurdle to their open pond projects. So several of our reactors, and these are all operational, these are when they're really green. Uh, really brown. Various methodologies for introducing the gas. The first one is a simple and airlift reactor, which is sparges in gas to get both circulation and CO2 feed. The second two reactors utilize an induction system, not a sparging or a bubbling system. We just pull the air in with the, with the air water adductor. Uh, we've moved up in scale toward a 100 kilowatt pilot point facility. This is one of our early prototypes um, to get an understanding of the behavior of our material selection, the overall flow of hydrodynamics, and some of the thermal and growth issues, especially sunlight utilization for our system. Our eventual goal is to actually establish a, a pilot point study at a coal fired power plant. And I'll show you kind of a satellite image of one of the potential locations that have been discussed. And our current focus is on CO2 capture. And people often ask us what we're going to do with our biomass. We're focusing on the mitigation capture now. And then we're going to move, change gears, and start focusing after that more on how we're going to actually use that biomass in a way that doesn't cause another problem um, uh, by actually just emitting the CO2 all over the place rather than a nice concentrated form. So most likely it will be some sort of on-site utilization and then recycle as much of the carbon and the energy as possible. So this is our most recent and, and system. It's about 3,000 liters of photosynthetic volume, which is the clear tubes. Total system volume is about 4,600 liters. Um, it's a recirculatory system of extremely low flow rate. It's right below, and nothing that's in the laminar flow rate. So we have very little turb turbulence, which has been one of our hurdles right now, is to try to make sure we have just enough turbulence um, to get good mixing and good stirring and to prevent some other problems from occurring. But the organ filling the reactor, putting nutrients in, 
and that's what happens after a little while. So we have this beautiful green fog, but it's more like a hallway. And we can maintain this organism at, at this growth rate for long periods of time, partly because we're a closed loop system and we do continuous uh, harvesting. So we keep ourselves down on the uh, growth curve in the exponential region out of the stationary kind of like I was going to promise you before, we're looking at setting up a, probably about a six, seven acre test facility at Triple County is one of the suggested sites. Um, that the space we'd be setting up is, is will be down in this region here. It's pretty flat, but at the same time, um, I guess when you're trying to first buy the plant, you don't want to build on the side of the mountain. The potential exists for both access to the <coughs> to and to um, um, inexpensive raw materials. And uh, with that, I'll uh, pause for any questions. Um, I've given you kind of a real quick overview. It's probably extremely quick. Um, but at the same time, um, several of us are around. I, sh I should probably point out that the, the group does work beyond biofuels. We actually have a fairly robust uh, environmental catalysis group focused uh, on automotive catalysis, specifically in track development and transportation for automotive so Thank you. Is there a dependence between growth of algae and uh, pressure of carbon dioxide? Well, uh, yes, there would be if you were in a closely pressurized system, you get greater solubility and you can actually increase the amount of CO2 in your system. Our system is, is as close to atmospheric as we can be um, so that we don't leak. So we're not negative pressure, we actually leak a little bit. Um, but our system is designed not to use sparging. So but the, can you use, can mm -hmm. you use a high pressure? We could use high pressure, yes. And, and the reason we're not using high pressure is our likely source does not want to have a significant pressure differential between our uh, uh, CO2 induction system and their. But uh, it can be their. used actually in the reactor side if you have your current. Yes, but we have to change our reactor material likely as well. So it's kind of a trade off. And, and we're not to the point where we really have had enough time to evaluate it. But there are other options and opportunities that we're talking about. So, whereas our current reactor materials are about 30 mils in thick. Thickness and, and they're not sealed. They're just they usually have clamps and a series of just basically rubber gaskets that are holding everything together. If we move to a higher pressure system, we would likely have to move to a much more uh, expensive capital wise process. But again, it would be a trade off between how much faster can we get our, our system, our, our carbon dioxide we consume, or algae growth versus the capital cost and the expense and the size of the system. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so how do you think this algae technology <coughs> compete with the uh, existing technology like basically amino solders or with uh, uh, membranes for CO2 capture? Well I would hope they wouldn't compete. Actually they could be very they can be very um, collaborative technologies. So with the amine scrubbers and the uh, and the membrane strategies you're, you're actually doing a very good benefit for us by reducing the volume of our feed stream. We don't need the nitrogen per se. We need the carbon dioxide and some of the other materials. So that technology actually can reduce the overall process volume of, of air we have to move and actually make our process significantly more efficient. I don't see it as a competitor if we need to do carbon dioxide sequestration. Our strategy only works if we pour it in a mine. So I mean, there are going to have people who have proposed that, basically just pouring in holes in the ground and letting the algae settle out and the water. But they, they, they can't compete on the same part. But again, they're not really Any uh, special requirement for the carbon dioxide to be feeded to the uh, algae in tanks? Uh, in terms of the flue gas, we have to be, we have to actually go through our FGD system. Uh, too much sulfur dioxide will rapidly make our reactor non-viable. Everything will die. But other than that, no, there's no real requirement. We we are we're designing our system to operate on a flue gas chain of about 14 percent CO2. So. Um, what we would like to have is a system where the organism selected doesn't grow on the sidewalls of the reactor, which is actually one of the problems that has has crippled a lot of closely photobioreactor schemes. Is that you'll have this organ one of the organisms that will be present will actually rather grow on the sidewall rather than in the planktonic or free solution. So trying to encourage the system either via the additives or, or, or organism selection is a big hurdle. And all of those factors work into what can and cannot be brought in in the, in the gas feed stream.